I grew up in a small coastal village in Kerala. For me, going to high school meant a long, lonely walk, crossing a little stream on the way. Sometimes, the water level in the stream would rise very high, forcing me to wade through waist-deep waters. I learned in school that the collective might of the sun and the moon caused this periodic wetting of my trousers. During the low tide, the mangrove trees in the surroundings would unravel their mystery roots, which grew upward to breathe. There would be crabs of different colors running around, mudskippers crawling about, and birds engaged in a feeding frenzy. Perhaps it was this childhood fascination that inspired me to choose marine biology for my master's and the Indian Forest Service for a career. But my real indoctrination to the science of mangroves came through an international training program conducted by the MS Swaminathan Foundation in 1992. This was an intensive 10-week training program which exposed me to the amazing diversity of the mangrove ecosystem, its value to the coastal communities, and its relevance in the context of climate change and sea level rise. A particularly striking revelation was how mangroves are linked to fisheries. The young ones of fishes love the mangrove ecosystem for the abundance of food and the protection they get from the predators. I was convinced that the importance of mangroves was as much global as it was local. One of the places we visited was the famous Chidambaram temple in Tamil Nadu, situated close to the Pichavaram mangroves. Here, the Stalavrsham, or the temple tree that protects the presiding deity, is a mangrove. Even gods look up to mangroves for protection. This is not surprising, because the presence or absence of mangroves can at times mean life or death to the coastal communities. For, take, for example, two Sri Lankan villages in the aftermath of the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004, Vandrupa and Kaputanwala. One had destroyed all its mangroves, and the loss of lives in tsunami was 6,000. But the other had a dense mangrove cover of 200 hectares which restricted the loss of lives to as low as two. Unfortunately, over time, we forget these ghastly tales and move forward. Forward with the business of environmental destruction. The story is in two different in our country. Cities like Mumbai are always at the receiving end of an incessant human migration in search of a better life. Slums proliferate here at the expense of mangroves and other open spaces. The breathing roots of mangroves are chalked with solid waste discarded by the teeming millions. In the rural areas, mangroves are hacked for fuel wood and mangrove lands are reclaimed for agriculture, shrimp farming, salt manufacture, and tourism. With so many factors pitted against them, one would imagine that the mangroves of Maharashtra, and more particularly that of Mumbai, would be in a downward spiral of destruction and possible extinction, right? But wait, let me give you some statistics. This is from the Forest Survey of India, which assesses India's forest cover every two years. Look at the growth of mangroves in Maharashtra from 2013 onwards. An amazing 63% increase in just four years. Mumbai, with all its problems, still managed an impressive 50%. How did Maharashtra achieve this exceptional growth when mangroves across the world were fighting a losing battle? This incredible story coincides with the emergence of the mangrove cell established in 2012. This also gave me the opportunity to contribute my bit towards mangrove conservation. One of the first things we did 
was to map the mangroves of the entire 720 kilometer coast of Maharashtra using high resolution satellite images. After this, 15,000 hectares, that is nearly all of the mangroves on government land, were declared as reserve forests. Millions of mangrove plants were planted in degraded forest areas. Overcoming stiff resistance from slum mafia and powerful lords, more, more than 6,000 illegal constructions on mangrove land in Mumbai were razed to the ground. To liberate the mangroves of Mumbai from the accumulated solid waste of decades, a clean mangrove campaign was organized. In this campaign, 25,000 citizen volunteers joined the mangrove cell to remove thousands of tons of solid waste from the mangroves of Mumbai. In rural areas, we adopted a participatory management approach. Institutions called mangrove co-management committees were created at the grassroots level, and a number of sustainable livelihood activities were introduced. Oyster farming, crab farming, cage fish farming. These activities were primarily run by women's groups. The additional income that they brought to their families gave them financial independence and a greater say in family decisions. Today, a group of women in Sindhudurg earns a decent income through mangrove ecotourism. They use their muscle power to ferry tourists to the mangrove areas in their backyard. Watch these amazing semi-literate women entertain their guests with what? The scientific names of mangrove species. <laughs> Avicenia Marina, Avicenia Avicenia, Raja Brahmi Prasad, Sonarashi Alba, Brugera Cylindrica, Candle A Candle, and Acanthus. Almost sounds like an Eminem rap. <laughs> the confidence and optimism of these women stem from the realization that the friendly neighborhood mangroves will always be there to steer them through troubled waters. Mangrove cell adopted completely different strategies in the rural and urban settings to achieve the overall goal of mangrove conservation. The mission is far from complete and there are challenges galore, but the beautiful response of the mangroves to our conservation initiatives gives us the hope that if governments and communities can work together, we can save this wonderful gift of nature. Thank you.